Hi, I'm John Edmiston and this is Biblical EQ Session 3, Testing the Theory, also called uh, Spiritual Christians versus Carnal Christians. In the last two sessions we looked at what is EQ, what does it comprise of, and the role of the Holy Spirit in transforming us. And we were found that there was five stages to emotional transformation. That emotions came from as we perceived a situation, that perception came and interacted with our beliefs. Our beliefs then generated an emotion. This emotion then interacts with our physical body and is finally expressed as tears, as joy, as whatever emotion comes out at the end. So let's go through those five stages again. We perceive a situation, that perception interacts with our belief system, our belief system then generates an emotion, the emotion then interacts with our body chemistry and our physical body and comes out as an emotion. And we found that the Holy Spirit was active at all five stages and the Holy Spirit gave Jesus godly perceptions, godly emotions, the godly physical body, godly beliefs and so on and so forth, and that the Holy Spirit can do the same for you and I. In this session, we will test that. We will check, is that really so? Does it work out? Do people who have more of the Holy Spirit have better emotions? And do people who have less of the Holy Spirit have worse emotions? Does the Holy Spirit really make a difference? Does this theory work? Or is John Edmiston just coming up with another theory from the Bible? Uh, one that may or may not be true. So we've got to check the scriptures and we've got to see, does it really work? And so this session is looking about, uh, looking at whether the Holy Spirit really does make a difference. Whether people who have more of the Holy Spirit who are more of God have better emotions and a higher EQ, a higher emotional intelligence, than people who have less of the Holy Spirit. Before we do that, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have died on the cross for us to redeem us from our sins and to take all our pain and to take all our grief and to take all our suffering and to heal us in body, soul, mind and spirit and transform us into your image. You came into this world to change this world and to transform this world. And now you are the Lamb of God sitting upon the throne in heaven. And in your name we ask that you will be over this session. That this DVD will be anointed and it will bless many. And Lord, we ask that you'll be over our life. That you may transform us from glory to glory. For you have set your Holy Spirit. You have sent the Holy Spirit from heaven upon your disciples and upon your apostles and upon all who believe in you, to the fathers and to the sons, to the third and fourth, tenth and thousandth generation, Lord Jesus, you have sent that your Holy Spirit. And you have sent that Holy Spirit into your church that it may be holy and blameless without spot or wrinkle. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be present even as I speak and preach and teach. And that we may see the difference that he, God the Holy Spirit, makes in our lives through the work and power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. In your name, O Lord, we pray for your glory to come upon this session and for this to be a blessing to many. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, we're asking the question, does the theory work? If biblical EQ is true, it should predict how people process their emotions. If emotional integrity is closely related to the work of the Holy Spirit, then there should be a very different result for apostles and for great Christian leaders versus carnal Christians who have very little of the Holy Spirit. So we are going to look at these two groups of people, the apostles and great Christian leaders and the carnal Christians, and see if there is any measurable difference that we can see in the Bible. Does the Bible tell us that these two groups are different emotionally? Well, they much the same. So... These two groups, if the theory is correct, should have very different emotional lives. Those who are closer to the Spirit should have better emotional lives, and those who are resisting the Spirit should have worse emotional lives. So let's look at the five stages. Perception, beliefs, internal emotion generated, the interaction with the physical disposition, and the outward expression. Let's see if these change between the apostles and leaders and the carnal Christians. First, perception for the apostles and leaders we will find that the, the apostles and leaders should see the world differently from the rest of us. For them, the kingdom perspective should be the truth perspective. They should see things from the kingdom of God point of view. They should, from time to time, have a deep perception of life situations. Their perception should come from the Holy Spirit, not from the eyes or the ears. 
They should see into the hearts of men and women and be able to speak accurately to people's condition. Thirdly, they will have a perception that is sometimes just purely spiritual. They should be conversant with dreams and visions and symbolic language. And when they come to the Bible, to come to the scriptures, they should understand it and be excited by the scriptures and excited by the prophetic because it's coming to alive to them because the Holy Spirit is making the Bible come alive to them. What about their beliefs, the next stage? What should be something that the apostles and leaders have in their beliefs system if they're influenced by the Holy Spirit? They should have beliefs that the surrounding culture has not taught them, that only God could have taught them. They will have beliefs that the surrounding culture opposes vehemently, beliefs that have been put into them by God, just as Moses had when he walked out of Egypt. Beliefs that only God can have taught them. These new beliefs, these spiritual beliefs, should give them a sense of what is righteous and what is unrighteous, just like Jesus had when he went into the temple and saw the corruption there and cleansed it out. They should have unusual zeal, poise and power. They should be able to walk through uh, situations knowing what's right and wrong and being very clear and very firm about that. Sixthly, their belief should give them unusual poise and power in crisis situations. Just as Jesus had in the storm on Lake Galilee or Paul did when he was caught on the ship and uh, they were blown here and there for many weeks and everyone was about to give up. But Paul had power and poise given to him by God. Seventhly, as a result of those beliefs that they have, the new beliefs that the Holy Spirit gives them, they should resonate with and be drawn to other people who have spiritual beliefs. They should hang out with the people of faith and be drawn to people of great faith, just like Jesus was with the centurion. Next stage, the stage of emotions. This, uh, the apostles and Christian leaders who are greatly influenced by the Holy Spirit should have deep and vivid emotions like those of Jesus Christ. They shouldn't be trivial. They should be deep, vivid, powerful spiritual emotions if the Holy Spirit is really working in them. They should have a sense of their emotions being God's emotions. They should know that, hey, I'm feeling what God's feeling at this time. This cry for the lost, my weeping of Jerusalem, this is from God. This is a God emotion coming into me, coming into my life at this time. They should be aware of what they're feeling and able to name it clearly as Jesus did with his emotions. Next, point 10, they should be people of authentic and powerful emotional expression. They should have groans and tears and crying and rejoicing. Their emotions should be like the emotions of Jesus, which were powerful. In the physical nature, the apostles and Christian leaders should have their physical nature renewed by the Holy Spirit so they can demonstrate victory over addictions, victory over sexual temptations, victory over their physical nature and their, their genetic predisposition to disobedience, which has come into us since Adam. They should be able to master their natural tendency to disobey, to rebel, to sin, to lust, to be caught up in drugs or alcohol, and they should have victory over these things through the power of the Holy Spirit renewing them, if the theory is true. And the apostles should be able to express their emotions in godly ways through their physical bodies. And in outward expression, we should find that their righteous emotions should lead to righteous actions, such as when Jesus' compassion, his inner emotion, moved him to act and to heal the sick. Point 14. Their emotionality should be an integral part of being a righteous person. So... Their emotions should lead to a righteousness in their personality and a righteousness in their acts. Their emotionality will not be detached from life like the emotions of an actor or a hypocrite. Their emotions will be integrated into their life. It won't be uh, like some performer. Their emotions will feel rock solid and lead to righteous living. Fifteen, the course of their life should demonstrate an ever-increasing wisdom in emotional expression. We find that in Paul as he uh, grew from being a very uh, harsh person early on in his ministry to being a very gracious person later on. And when we observe the lives of apostles and Christian leaders, we, we should say, maybe God's teaching this person. Maybe God's growing this person. Maybe God's teaching them how to say things and giving them a real anointing. So do those predictions we've just made hold? Do those things really happen in the lives of apostles and Christian leaders? Yes, they do. We find that the apostles do have deeper perceptions of spiritual situations and of life. They do have different beliefs. They do have more powerful emotions. They do demonstrate physical victory over sin and addiction. And they do have a very gracious outward expression, an ex outward expression that lines up with love and kindness and gentleness. But scripture and history tell us that the Holy Spirit did indeed produce these things in people who were submitted fully to him. Now, before we go any further, before we look at, into these emotions more, we have to make a little bit of a, a definition and of a distinction 
between vivid emotions and immature emotions. The Holy Spirit produces vivid emotions, strong emotions in those who are committed to God. The Holy Spirit does not produce immature emotions up and down, up and down, all over the place. Let's look at some of God's vivid emotions in Psalm 30. You can look it up in your Bibles, Psalm 30. I just picked a Psalm at random and looked at some of the words, of uh, the um, emotion words in this Psalm. I'll just uh, maybe indicate them as I go along. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up, not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favour is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favour, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So we see all these emotion words in there. Extol, praise, thanks, weeping, mourning, uh, being troubled, crying out, making supplication, singing praise, and so on and so forth. How, uh, crying out for mercy, uh, dancing even, as one of the emotions there. And we find that there is a difference here between these vivid emotions and immature emotions. The negative emotions of a godly person are temporary. David says, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So his negative emotion was temporary. Weeping was temporary. It lasted for a night. But joy comes in the morning as the Holy Spirit gives us a new perspective on our situation. A friend of mine was... Uh, uh, weeping over the passing of her father, an elderly man who had passed away just after his wife. Only two weeks after his wife passed away, he passed away. And she was praying to the Lord about this and said, you know, I'm losing my father. You know. And uh, the Lord said to her, uh, you're not losing your father. He is coming here to be with me and to be with his wife. When she got God's perspective on the situation, she was able to rejoice because she knew her father was going to be with Jesus in heaven. And she knew that her father was going back to be with the wife he loved so much. Joy came in the morning. Weeping lasted the night, but joy came in the morning because she knew where her father was going and she got a spiritual perspective and a spiritual belief that changed that situation. In a godly person, there is a righteous resolution of the, moment, of the emotions, a giving of thanks in the end. It doesn't end in despair. Jesus says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. I will sing praise to you because you have done these things for me. At the end of all the emotional turmoil, there's praise and thanksgiving. The emotions of a godly person are directed primarily towards God in a private and emotional fashion. They are not acted out or dumped on others. Even in, in the Psalms where David is most angry, we call them the imprecatory Psalms, where he seems to be cursing someone and say, oh Lord, you know, punish this person, do this. He's not yelling at the person themselves. He's talking to God about that person. Now David was a king. He could have just got that annoying person and chopped their head off and got rid of them. He had all the power. In those days, kings had enormous power because they weren't limited by parliaments and constitutions. So he could have just gone, chop, and got rid of that person. Instead, he talked to God about that person. He didn't yell at that person. He didn't abuse that person. He did not take revenge by his own hands. He talked the emotions out to God in a private fashion and let God deal with that person. So the emotions are directed primarily towards God and they're not dumped out on other people. For a godly person, there is a wide range of appropriate emotions, from joy to a troubled spirit. We see them all there in Psalm 30. His spirit was troubled, then there's joy, then there's this. The emotional thermostat is not just stuck in one position. And we find some people who've got to be happy, happy, happy all the time, or other people who are sad and gloomy and serious all the time. Uh, but in the Holy Spirit, we have a wide range of emotions available to us. A godly person, such as the person in Psalm 30, has an ability to see good in God in the midst of it all. They don't lose perspective. At the end of the day, they're giving praise and giving thanks and they're working the situation through before the Lord and they're retaining the eternal spiritual perspective. They're going to God 
uh, rather than just looking at the problem. They're looking at the solution, the Lord and the scriptures, rather than just at the problem. And they're seeing good and they're seeing God in the midst of all these situations because they have faith. A godly person doesn't stifle their emotions. Uh, there's a powerful expression of emotion in Psalm 30. He says that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. So he's not just going to sit there in a stainless steel tube being all silent and serious. He's going to rejoice to the Lord. Uh, and uh, in Psalm 30, we see a repentance of false perspectives and beliefs. At some point, he had a, uh, an attitude that needed changing. He says, now in my prosperity, I said, I shall not be moved. That was a wrong thing for him to think. Uh, and then God challenged him. And David repents of this self-sufficiency. And so he, de he then realizes that he is dependent on God and cries out to God. People who are out of balance emotionally do the opposite. They don't repent of their false beliefs. They cling even more stubbornly to their false beliefs. But David said, OK, I've got a wrong attitude. I'm getting rid of it. And in Psalm 30, we find this genuine dignity and beauty. The emotions are expressed appropriately. They're expressed in wonderful ways. There's genuine poetry there. So God has taught David how to write Psalms, how to express things in beautiful ways. We find that in, in Psalm 30, a very vivid, very powerful, but very godly expression of emotions. Now, we all find that people have different temperaments. They have different ways of expressing emotions, different personalities that God has given them. Barnabas was a great encourager of people. He, he didn't like conflict at all, but he was a great encourager and a person who always believed in people and hugged them and brought them alongside and, and said, OK, this guy can do a great job. And he recommended people to other people. Peter was a great preacher. He was a big man. Uh, he, they called him the big fisherman. And uh, he was a powerful, anointed preacher, but his high emotionality that made him a great preacher sometimes made him a little bit unstable, but God fixed that and made him uh, a rock and a master evangelist and the founder of the church. Paul had a razor sharp mind. He was a real intellectual, wrote all the epistles, and he was very good at attending to all the management and operational details of church life. Uh, he, was, he got things right. He got things aligned correctly. The Apostle John was a bit of a mystic. He had dreams and he had visions and he saw things uh, in terms of light and dark and uh, good and evil and black and white a little bit. Uh, and, but he paid attention to the deep abiding spiritual realities and, and he was very much a man of prayer and prophecy. Titus, who was one of Paul's uh, workers that worked alongside of Paul, he seems to have been a, a really tough manager kind of guy, a troubleshooter. Whenever there was a mess, Paul would send Titus there. He sent Titus off to Crete, he sent Titus into Corinth, he sent Titus into various different tough situations and Titus would come in and fix them up. And it says at one point that the Corinthians received Titus with fear and trembling. He must have been quite a character, uh, a sort them out kind of guy. And Timothy was the absolute opposite of Titus. Timothy was always in Ephesus. He didn't travel around. Paul didn't use Timothy as a troubleshooter. Timothy was the sensitive pastor, par excellence, a great listener to people, a great person. But he had a little problem with timidity. So Paul said to him, God has not given you a spirit of timidity of power and love and a sound mind. Stand the ground, be a good soldier, endure suffering with me. And he always encouraged Timothy to come out of his timidity and uh, come out of his desire to uh, uh, be a people pleaser, which is very common in the ministry, and instead to have courage and strength uh, in that. So we all have our different temperaments. Now, temperament is not bad, it's good. God's built that temperament into you and he's going to use you. He used Barnabas to be an encourager, Paul to be a teacher, Peter to be a preacher, Timothy to be a pastor, and so on and so forth. And God can even use your weaknesses because when you are weak, then God is strong. Remember that in, I think, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So God can use you just as you are, but also God has a plan to change you and to make you better. God loves you as you are, but God loves you too much to leave you as you are. So he's going to get some of those wrinkles out of you. But even while you're still a little bit... Uh, uh, have your lumps and bumps while you're still as you are God can use you because God can draw straight lines with bent sticks uh, God can just pick you up even with your lumps and bumps and still use you because he is God Almighty and when you are weak he is strong so don't write yourself off but let yourself be transformed by the renewing of your mind let God change you because he has a plan to change you into the image of his beloved son so God accepts you, but being accepted does not mean being unchanged. 
The Holy Spirit's going to take certain parts of your basic emotional temperament and refine them into the image of Christ Jesus. Paul matured in tolerance and love. We see him starting off being very harsh, writing to the Galatians. By the time he writes Philemon, it's a very gracious and uh, gentle epistle. Peter becomes stable and reliable. Timothy overcomes his timidity and becomes a great pastor. Each person in the Bible went through changes and they and God worked in them and God made them a better person and God strengthened them in their place of weakness and kept them and sanctified them. As the Holy Spirit convicts you and teaches you and ministers to you, a slow but sure transformation will take place that will increase your maturity in Christ and your usefulness to the Master. During revivals, sometimes we have very powerful emotions, such as the, the Wesleyan revival back in the 1700s. And uh, John Wesley says, While I was enforcing these words, be still and know that I am God. God began to bear his arm, not in private, but in the open air, and before more than 2,000 witnesses, one then another and yet another was struck to the earth, greatly trembling at the presence of God's power. Others loudly and bitterly cried, What must be do to be saved? This is John Wesley, the founder of the Methodists, and one of the first people to preach about being born again. So during these revivals, you will see powerful things happen. And when God's Spirit comes into our lives, and our life is full of mess and full of complacency, there's going to be a powerful interaction there. Uh, and people are going to powerfully react to the, the presence and power and the glory of God. Very few revivals have been without great emotion. But emotion is not the purpose of the revival. Emotion is a byproduct. The revivalist John Edwards wrote a famous treatise on religious affections or religious emotions, which established that emotions are a byproduct of grace, not its chief aim. The aim of the godly evangelist is not an emotional audience, but a repentant audience. If you can get people repentant without affecting their emotions, well, that's fine. But most of the time when people repent, then they do experience a powerful emotional experience. So that repentance will make them weep or cry. Uh, and also, the other goal of the evangelist is a believing audience. And when people's beliefs change, when their uh, eyes are opened, when they come to new truth, there is often a powerful emotion generated, an aha moment. as oh yes, the Lord has spoken to me. If the emotions are ex uh, expressed so powerfully, and, they, and the emotions that are, are expressed in the audience indicate that repentance is taking place, that learning is taking place, that transformation is taking place. If the emotions are appropriate to changed lives, then the emotions are good. But if the emotions are just all over the place, if the emotions have nothing to do with repentance or change, but are just chaos, then the emotions are a work of the devil or of the flesh. So hype, manipulated sentimentality, manipulated emotions, people being hypnotized and worked up, that isn't of God. We don't want those kind of emotions in ministry. We want the emotions that are produced by the Holy Spirit. The emotions accompany grace and may be an outward sign of an inward work of God, but they're not compulsory. They don't have to happen. But if they do happen, just remember that grace sometimes produces great changes and great emotions in people's lives. Now, I come from a very sort of stiff upper lip kind of background, as you might be able to tell from my accent. And I came from that church background where I thought that Christian maturity was dull and unemotional and bureaucratic. That as you became a more mature Christian, you became rather somber. Uh, and that was my thought until I read the scriptures and I realized the mature Christians weren't somber and dull and bureaucratic at all. They were people who were full of the life of God. Maturity is not the loss of emotions, but their deepening, enriching, and appropriate expression. We don't become dull, we become alive. God gives us life and gives us the ability to have rich, deep, and appropriate emotions. Christian emotional maturity does, however, involve stability. We are not to be tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine. We're not to have our emotions going up and down from week to week and always being uh, bounced around by an emotional yo-yo. There's to, to be a strong inner core of stability in a spiritual person. The Bible tells us to grow up in all things into Christ in the book of Ephesians. So we're supposed to be growing ups in our emotions. We're supposed to have solid adult, intelligent, emotional life, and we're to become a person participating in the stature and fullness of Christ. And this stature and fullness of Christ also involves things like zeal. It says we should be unflagging in zeal. We should be zealous for good works. Uh, we, and it says of Jesus that zeal for thy house has consumed me. 
And so we should have this ability to have zeal, to, to want to bless people, to want to care for people. We should be moved into action by the powerful emotions that are generated in our lives by the Holy Spirit. In fact, part of our uh, purpose in life is to become a people who are zealous for good deeds. That's Titus 2.14. So we find that someone who is an apostle or a great Christian leader is full of zeal, is full of strong emotions, is going out there doing the things of God just like Peter and Paul were, they're impelled by the Holy Spirit. And yes, for those who have, uh, are close to the Holy Spirit, we find that they indeed have a resonant and powerful emotional life. But what about the other extreme, the carnal Christians, the people who are without the Holy Spirit? A carnal Christian is a person who is not spiritual. Let's look at that, the phrase carnal Christian in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the first few verses. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal. So there's spiritual people and there's carnal people, as do babes in Christ. So the babe in Christ, the person who has not conquered their flesh, that's a carnal Christian. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. And he's talking to Christians here, the Corinthian church. He's writing to a church, but he's calling this church carnal. They're not unbelievers, they're carnal. They're Christians who are still dominated by their flesh. These are the Christians in Corinth, a very fleshly place. For there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when, says, uh, when one says, I am a Paul, and another, I am a Paulus, are you not carnal? So the indication of their carnality was their divisiveness and their argumentation and their poor emotional state. This was a, uh, a uh, indication with all the squabbling and, and the problems that were going on in Corinth. And we'll look at that in more, more detail. So what's a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian is a Christian. They're, they're born again, they're a member of the church, they're sitting in their pews, but their life is still dominated by fleshly thinking. They've still got a lot of stinking thinking, as we call it. Uh, and their mind isn't renewed yet. They, they, they haven't let their mind be fully renewed by the gospel. Their beliefs are half the world's beliefs, half God's beliefs, a bit of this, a bit of that. And they're still operating just as a mere man, just as a person out in the world would, would operate and not from the spirit. They're not operating in... Uh, a fully spiritual way. They're not operating as spiritual people. So if a person is, a long, is still carnal, if they're not operating as a spiritual person, what can we expect? We would expect that they would see the world in much the same terms as the surrounding culture because the Holy Spirit won't have given them new perceptions. They'll think just like anyone out there in the world. They won't have a kingdom perspective. They'll be self-centered. They'll be seeking their own comfort. They will be criticizing the preacher because he doesn't meet their expectations. They won't have a real spiritual understanding of the world. A person without much of the Holy Spirit who's carnal will be unable to see into the hearts of men and women and their empathy will be rare. They will be selfish. They won't speak accurately to the human condition because they're out of tune. They won't understand the Bible very much because they have a carnal mind, not a spiritual mind. They won't get dreams and visions. They won't understand prophecy. Everything will be puzzling to them. Point four, we find that uh, their belief system, belief system of a carnal Christian, will be mainly those of the surrounding culture because they won't have picked up on the spiritual things. They will not hold beliefs that the culture opposes vehemently. They will have few beliefs that only God could have taught them. A carnal Christian will have a very weak sense of what is righteous and what is unrighteous because the Holy Spirit won't be giving them that sense of righteous and unrighteous. They tolerate things. They might tolerate selling doves in the temple. They'll let a little bit of sin here and a bit of sin there. We find the Corinthians were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper and things like that, quite tolerating quite unusually bad behaviour. Zeal will be unusual for them. They will tend to be apathetic. We find that in Hebrews. Uh, and they won't be consumed by kingdom interests. Sixthly, we find that uh, because they're a long way from God, they won't have much poison power in crisis situations. They'll be full of panic. They'll be full of division. That when, when things get tough, uh, they'll be out of there in a shot. They'll be prone to anxiety. Seventhly, because they don't have the Holy Spirit, they won't resonate with and be emotionally drawn to people of faith. They'll be puzzled by people of faith. They'll resist Paul and Titus when they turn up. We find that uh, carnal Christians, we will predict that they will not have deep, vivid and stable emotions like those of Jesus Christ. Instead, their emotions will be all over the place. They'll be characterized by shallow, sentimental, spiritual feelings and they will be blown by, around by every wind of doctrine. We also can predict that they will have little sense of their emotions being God's emotions. Their emotions will be just their own human emotions. They'll be unaware of what they're feeling and will be unable to name their emotions clearly. Point 10, they will, we can predict they will not be people of authentic emotional expression. And we find this a lot in Corinth. A person who is not spiritual 
will not demonstrate victory over addictions and sexual temptations. They will be overwhelmed by them because they don't have enough power from God to deal with them. Uh, point 12, we'll find that uh, we can predict that they will fail to express their emotions in godly ways through their bodies and we'll find that's true later on. Point 13, we find that without much of the Holy Spirit, their spiritual emotions will rarely lead to righteous actions. There'll be no power there. They'll feel something, but it won't happen. Compassion for the lost of Paul will really be felt, and if it's felt, it won't result in much happening. Uh, point 14, we'll find that their emotions will be like those of an actor or a hypocrite. They won't be integrated into their life. They'll be put on as a mask. Uh, point 15, we'll, we can predict that the course of their lives will not demonstrate an ever-increasing wisdom in emotional expression. They'll be like a clanging gong or, or a clashing cymbal. Uh, they'll become discordant and out of tune emotionally. Their predictions, and we find those predictions hold. Let's look at what the Bible says about carnal Christians, and we find it will line up with those 15 predictions. The carnality of the Corinthians church is reflected in a long list of very serious sins. We find the first four chapters detail all this division and arguing and strife and following Paul or following Apollos. We find there's intellectual pride all over the place and spiritual pride and factions and infighting. Chapters 5 and 6 of 1 Corinthians show they're visiting prostitutes after church and they're engaging in sexual immorality and incest. Uh, and Paul is trying to rebuke them for these behaviours. And chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians that discusses marriage, divorce, and the basics of sexually appropriate behaviour because they didn't even know how to behave as single people. When they were out of a relationship, uh, they were behaving wrongly. And chapters 8 to 11 correct gross disorder, disorder that you and I would pro never expect in a church such as being drunk at the Lord's Supper, not waiting for one or another at meals, but barging in at the potluck and just gobbling up all the food before people have arrived. One's full and another's hungry. We find them not just gobbling food at the Lord's Supper, but going down the road to an idol's temple and eating there. Uh, they were so lusting after their stomachs that they would go into these idol's temples and, and feast in an inappropriate place in a completely pagan and non-Christian environment. Uh, like worse than going to Las Vegas. Okay. Chapters 12 to 14 reveal a paganization of the spiritual gifts. So even when they had things of God, uh, such as tongues and prophecy, they paganized them. They used them in, uh, like they saw the, the, the priests in the temple used them. Uh, they used them in divisive and destructive ways without love. And Paul has to teach them in, in chapter 13 that the spiritual gifts are to be used in love. Uh, and chapter 15, we find major lack of insight into basic doctrines such as the resurrection. Uh, th they were saying, well, maybe the resurrection occurred, maybe it didn't. And Paul has to write an entire chapter on the resurrection just to get basic doctrine into them because their beliefs were not being renewed by the Holy Spirit. Corinth was a mess. But there were some churches that may have even been worse than Corinth. And that's the churches that James wrote to and the epistles of the Hebrews was uh, written to. The church James wrote to may have been really bad. We find that in James 4 verse 2 that they were actually murdering one another. Uh, you do not have because you do not ask, so you fight and kill. Uh, so the uh, members of this church were fighting and killing one another. They were murdering one another uh, because their prayers were not being answered because they were full of covetousness, they're full of the love of the world. They're actually killing one another. That's a pretty bad church. And they were treating the poor with contempt in James 2, 1 to 13. So a poor man would come into the church. Oh, you get over there, sit down there. And the rich man would come. Oh, good, good, good. You come. They, they, were, they were socially uh, so far out of tune that they treated poor people and rich people differently in the church. The writer the, to the Hebrews, uh, who we think was Paul, uh, or someone that knew Paul very well, he is astonishingly blunt. He calls his audience in various terms sluggish, unfruitful, dull of hearing, immature, like children, and says that they're neglectful of their salvation, in danger of drifting away from the faith, in danger of hardening their hearts to God's word, and on the point of having evil, unbelieving hearts. Hebrews 3 verse 12. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, it goes on, the writer goes on to say they are neglecting meeting together and on the verge of giving up the faith. So these people are so far away from God, from the Holy Spirit, they're almost giving up on church giving up on the faith. And they're on the verge of returning to sin and being judged by the living God. He has to warn them about judgment. They're so close to the edge of the Christian faith. Well, what happened? How did these churches that were visited by the apostles and had letters written to them by the apostles, which were part of the early church, end up such a mess? These churches committed various sins against the Holy Spirit. 
Now, when we sin against the Holy Spirit, we don't lose the Holy Spirit, but we grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. We do things to the Holy Spirit that prevents the Holy Spirit acting in our life. And we find terms such as grieved, quenched, lied to, put to the test, insulted and outraged, and made jealous. For unbelievers can also sin against the Holy Spirit, but that's very serious. We find the Pharisees blasphemed the Holy Spirit and they resisted the Holy Spirit and endured the false teachers are devoid of the Holy Spirit. But those last three categories, they're, they're for unbelievers. A Christian cannot blaspheme, resist or be devoid of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on and have a look at some of those sins against the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4 verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you and with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So what grieves the Holy Spirit? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. When you say something that's really nasty, that grieves the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. It's the spirit of tenderness, the spirit of gentleness and meekness. So when, you, when you're a nasty person, when you're bitter or wrathful, when you lose it in traffic, that grieves the Holy Spirit and you don't want to do that. So carnal behavior such as divisiveness, quarreling, church fights, church politics, these grieve the Holy Spirit. And uh, slander, malice, all these things, these immature behaviors grieve the Holy Spirit and push the Holy Spirit down in your life so you're less able to minister. So you've got to be a kind person. You've got to put away that stuff because that stuff's bad. It's toxic. You don't want that toxic stuff in your life. The other sin is quenching the Holy Spirit. And that's Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 to 21. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So quenching the Holy Spirit is being unrejoicing, unthankful, squashing down the gifts of the Holy Spirit and throwing out prophecy on the spiritual things that are controversial, saying, oh, no, 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 that's risky. We can't have that in the church. We're going to quench it. We're going to squash it. We're not going to have spiritual gifts here because they're risky. But Paul says, OK, you can handle this risky stuff. You're wise, you're mature. All you have to do is this. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good and don't let the evil stuff occur again. So when someone's prophesying or moving in the spirit, test it, check it out. If it's good, hold on to that. If it's rubbish, then you put that aside and you don't let that evil come up again. It says abstain from every form of evil. In some translations, every appearance of evil should be translated as, as every manifestation of evil. The word is morphe, from which we get morphology and other words like that. And so every way that evil sort of pops up every time it pops itself up you get rid of it so quenching the spirit is squashing the spirit's operation through spiritual gifts and dampening it down, uh, dampening down prayer dampening down thanksgiving dampening down rejoicing etc so the church becomes very dull and bureaucratic and a dull bureaucratic safe church this holy spirit has been quenched the holy spirit could also be lied to ananias and sapphira during the revival lied to the Holy Spirit about financial matters and were slain and were taken out the door of the church. We find that Acts chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. The Holy Spirit can be put to the test. That was the same thing about Ananias and Sapphira. They tried to lie to Peter and Peter saw into the situation and he said they were trying to put the Holy Spirit to the test. If you're trying to be deceitful in ministry, you're trying to test the Holy Spirit. You'll bring judgment on yourself. Don't be deceitful in your ministry. Don't be deceitful in your Christian work or your Christian walking live a life of integrity before the Lord. Don't try and put on a false face because God's going to see through that and you're going to be testing the Holy Spirit and you'll find judgment coming upon you. The Holy Spirit can be made jealous. Now let's look at that. It's James chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. What it's saying here is the spirit becomes jealous when we become friends with the world. If we become very worldly and we want this and we want that and we want the red Maserati and we want all the bling and we, we want this and we want that and we worship the things of this world rather than the things of God, then the Holy Spirit becomes jealous within us and becomes angry and we become an enemy of God. Uh, our spiritual walk uh, just falls to pieces if we become friends of the world. 
because then God becomes our enemy. That's not a good thing to be. Friendship with the world is seen as spiritual adultery and makes the spirit jealous. If we love the world as in worldliness, uh, not as in the world of people, uh, we enrage the Holy Spirit. Worldliness is often characteristics of carnal Christians and does great damage to their relationship with God. The Holy Spirit can be insulted or outraged, outraged or done despite unto. Hebrews 10.29 refers to someone who turns back from Christianity to Judaism to another religion. These are people who say, okay, I've, Christianity is too tough. I'm going to go back to being a Jew or going back to another religion. And this outrages the Holy Spirit of grace that is given to us. People who are devoid of the Spirit, Jude 1.19, they're, they're false teachers. They have nothing of the Spirit. They have swelling words and promises. They lead, entice people into sin. These people are not Christians and never have been. People who resisted the Holy Spirit, this was the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7, uh, where Stephen is speaking to them. They are all Jews. They're, none of them are Christians. They're stoning Stephen to death, and they're resisting the clear testimony of the Holy Spirit in Stephen's face, which was like that of an angel in the script, which he quoted in the common sense of his speech in Acts chapter 7. And of course, we have blaspheming the Holy Spirit, very controversial. We find it, say, in Matthew 12, verse 31, it's when the Pharisees and Sadducees accused the works of God of being evil, the works of Beelzebub. So their conscience has become inverted. They're calling good evil and evil good. When the conscience gets to the point where it's calling good evil and evil good, the conscience is so messed up that it's blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit and saying the good things of God, the things of the Holy Spirit, the things that are holy are bad. At this point, it cannot be forgiven because the person is in such a state they are in so uh, wicked a state that they don't know right from wrong, up from down. This can only happen for a non-Christian. A person can't even become a believer if they're in that state. That's why it's unforgiven, because they can't become a believer because they don't even have the ability to believe because their conscience is so just defiled, it's seared as with a hot iron, so they cannot perceive anything spiritually or correctly because of their sin. So we find the emotional consequences of sinning against the Holy Spirit are very grave. If you grieve the Holy Spirit, if you quench the Holy Spirit, if uh, you fight the Holy Spirit in your life, your emotional work in your life gets worse and worse. The more po people sin against the Holy Spirit, the nastier they become. They start stoning people like Stephen. They become vicious. They become quarrelsome. They become nasty. They become toxic. The more you sin against the Holy Spirit, the more you grieve, quench, lie to and test the Holy Spirit, the worse the consequences are going to be for your life. You might end up like Ananias and Sapphira being carried out the door dead. We find that people who were carnal Christians, uh, we find them pilfering, murdering, lying, fighting, quarreling, stealing, uh, uh, doing all sorts of dreadful things, visiting prostitutes, because they were so far away from God, their emotions were out of tune. They were not in tune with the Holy Spirit. So because they were not in tune with the Holy Spirit, because they were carnal, the Christian life was falling apart. As the Holy Spirit is quenched, grieved and resisted, his love departs from the person and hatred enters into the person. You either have love or hatred in your heart. You're either going towards God, who is love, or you're going away from God. And if you go away from God, you go away from love. If you go away from love, you enter into the darkness and hatred blinds your eyes and your heart. Uh, we'll find that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. So carnality produces a very low EQ. People who are carnal Christians have poor impulse control. They give in to sexual immorality, drunkenness, and, dis and disorder in their worship. People who are carnal Christians have poor anger management. They, they, they fight, they squabble, they divide. They say, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. They even murder people, as in James. People who are carnal Christians have disintegrating relationships, envying factions, strife, and contentions. They have low levels of personal motivation. They're sluggish. They're evil beasts, they're lazy gluttons, as it says in Titus. They're neglectful, dull of hearing, and in danger of drifting away because they don't have any personal energy and motivation. We find that people who are carnal Christians have toxic tongues. They are unstable. They follow after the latest false teachers who are good talkers and emotionally persuasive. They have a lack of basic empathy and compassion so that when someone walks in and they're poor, they treat them rudely, or they don't give food and shelter and they just say, I'll oh, be warm and filled. Uh, without actually doing anything for the person. We find this in James chapter 2. We find that uh, people who are carnal Christians have toxic tongues full of gossip, slander, and things like that proceeds out of, from their out-of-control emotions. We find that in James chapter 3. In fact, some people develop poisonous personalities. They can be a root of bitterness that defiles many. 
or they can be like the emotionally rigid Diotrephes who like to put himself first, control the church, kicking people out, uh, a vicious person, far away from God. But we find that carnal Christians are not given up on by God. Paul wrote to, taught, cared for and prayed for carnal Christians. Carnal Christians simply need teaching about Christ and the Holy Spirit. They need to be brought into maturity. Sometimes they need to be exhorted and rebuked and, and to be counseled and to be brought back from their sinful ways. And that's why it says the word of God is useful that the man of God may be equipped for every good work, and uh, including rebuking and training in righteousness. Some people need to be trained into righteousness. Carnal Christians need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They need to have a daily walk with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they need to ask God to fill them with the Holy Spirit, and then they need to follow what the Holy Spirit teaches them. They need to be centered on Christ and not on themselves. They have to say, okay, uh, if I'm centered on myself, that's going to destroy my life. I need to be centered on Christ and on the scriptures. I need to get into the Bible daily. I need to think about Jesus. I need to follow Jesus' commands. And they need to switch their life around so it's focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith. Carnal Christians also need accountable relationships of grace. They need people like Titus and Timothy and Paul and all the people that came into their life to try and straighten them out. They need to be held accountable. So Paul would send Titus in and Titus would then say, OK, we need this, 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 not this done in the church. And then Paul would go from person to person, checking them out and testing them and helping them to uh, grow in Christ. So what have we found so far? We started off this session by saying, we wanted to see if the five-step model was true and if the Holy Spirit really didn't make a difference. We found that the five-step model accurately predicts the emotional state of both saintly Christians and carnal Christians. We found that emotional authenticity is a work of the Holy Spirit. And we found that the Holy Spirit makes a big difference to people's emotional states. The further away someone is from the Holy Spirit, the worse their emotional state becomes. We do find that some non-Christians can have good, a good emotional state. That is because of what we call common grace. God works in everyone's life, even if they're not still a believer. And people that want to have a good emotional state, they are cooperating with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit's external work. Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in them yet, but they're starting to cooperate with God and God can move them towards salvation. But we, mostly we find that emotional functionality and authenticity come about through the person cooperating with the Holy Spirit, being saved, being born again, having God working in their life, as he forms spiritual perspectives and spiritual beliefs in the person so that they have a Christ-like outlook on life. We find that if we resist the work of the Holy Spirit, if we grieve the Holy Spirit and quench the Holy Spirit, this results in emotional catastrophe. People get worse and worse the more they fight with God. Emotionally undeveloped Christians who remain close to God, on the other hand, can grow into emotionally adept people. We find that Paul, who was originally abrasive, he was an emotionally undeveloped person, what perhaps we might call a bit of a nerd these days. Uh, he was emotionally undeveloped as a young man, but he grew into a mature apostle, a person of godly emotions, a person that people loved, and the Ephesian elders wept when he, he left them, that he would, they would see his face no more because they loved Paul. He uh, had become a, a beautiful human being through the work of the Holy Spirit. We find that cooperating with God means not grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit and being careful to avoid worldliness. So our big lesson is that the key factor in real, authentic, godly emotional development is your relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Are you listening to God? Are you listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit coming into your conscience? Are you getting into God's Word on a daily basis and having a quiet time? Are you participating in the things that the Holy Spirit is putting up in your heart? Are you rejoicing? Are you thanking God? Are you praying at all times? Are you doing the things that are consistent with a spiritual filled life? Do you have an attitude of gratitude? Are you merciful and kind and gentle and compassionate with your brothers? And as you do these things, you'll find that your emotions develop and they become more authentic, more godly and more real. We find that Christians, of course, need to be born again and spirit filled and obediently walking with the Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis. You need to get your act together with God. You need to do business with God. You need to decide that you're going to be born again, that you're going to be Spirit-filled, you're going to be Bible-based, and that you're going to obey those commandments of Jesus. You're not going to quench the Spirit. You're not going to grieve the Spirit. You're going to walk with the Holy Spirit, and you're going to let God transform you from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ. That's Biblical EQ Session 3. John Edmiston signing off. You can find all this material on our website at biblicaleq.com and you can find the book, 
Biblical EQ, a Christian handbook for emotional transformation at Amazon.com. God bless.